I love to see um, who all's here. So your name, um, where you're coming from and thinking back to your K-12 experience, what was a time when you re really felt seen by a teacher? I know that one of the things I can share is that I was taller than my kindergarten teacher. And I remember going home and telling my mom that I was very concerned about my kindergarten teacher because I had just learned in church the week before that elders get a little bit smaller. They start to get a little shorter as they get closer to death. So I thought if I was taller than my kindergarten teacher, she must not be doing very well health-wise. Um, so that wasn't necessarily an example of what time I felt seen, um, but it was a time when I felt and questioned like, who's at the front of this classroom and what does that mean for me? She's okay, she's still doing well. Um, but I just thought that I shared that example of how who's in front of the classroom really makes you think and tie together with what have you learned in other spaces and how do you feel connected to that learning environment. So excited to see so many people here today. Thank you so much for joining us and we are going to get started. So Isabella, if you can move forward. I get the pleasure of working with the most amazing team. My name is Serene Dunlevy Keenan. I'm a senior program officer here at the Greater Twin Cities United Way. I've been here since the start of our Career Academy project in 2015. And I get to be joined by two of the most fabulous colleagues. You'll see Liz Williams throughout the day today and Isabella Zhang, both here supporting this event and supporting a lot of what happens on our team. So part of what we're looking for in the chat is when's the, one of the times you were seen in the classroom. And then next slide, Isabella. Um, we're also wanting you to, to be really active in that chat box. So as you hear what's going on, you're going to hear two phenomenal examples from Dr. Kathy Funston, Matt Deutsch, and then the team um, under Dr. Bianco. Um, so really excited to have you here. Populate the chat with your questions and thoughts at any time. We know that there are a lot of people um, working from a home office, uh, me included, and so we understand that there should be some background noise, so come and go um, as you need to. This session, again, is recorded, and please connect with us anytime if you have questions, need follow-up materials, or you want to connect with any of the experts you see in this space today. You can move forward, Isabella. Um, one of the things we wanted to do is have a quick poll. So throughout your K-12 experience, how many Black, Indigenous, or people of color did you have as teachers? Um, so there should be a poll that comes up to you. Um, how many um, in your K-12 career? How many teachers of color did you have? My early K-12 experience um, was at a private school with zero teachers of color. Um, went through the St. Paul public school system from junior high and high school and still um, only have one teacher of color, which I had for two days um, before she transitioned into another line of work. Yeah, so we'll hear from a lot of people. I think not a lot of teachers of color that they've seen or experienced, and we're here to start to talk about how to change that. Hearing a little construction noise in the background for me. So apologies if that is coming through. Um, so you can either answer it on the poll or I see some of those answers coming through in chat. Um, one of the things um, that we find phenomenally important and that we see in the career pathway space and particularly um, as we hope to influence uh, teacher pathways in the, in the career pathway space is making sure that students find a space where they're seen, supported and allowed to take risks to advance their own education and learning. Far too often students in Minnesota do not see themselves represented at the front of the classroom. We've seen a wide variety of strategies to address this, but clearly a lot of different strategies aren't enough. Um, we, right now, our current state um, is that we have 35% students of color and, an indige and indigenous students throughout the state of Minnesota, and our teaching workforce have just over 5% teachers of color. So I wanna um, personally invite you to this conversation and invite you um, to work that we can do to change that. So we see um, in a lot of different spaces. So certainly in our students who are in career pathways, but also people that are supporting the educational system in either out of school time programs, youth work, in a lot of other spaces where we see individuals who are doing amazing work and we'd love to have a, a conversation with them about how to enter the teacher workforce. 
So I want to personally thank you for coming to our Career Pathway Community of Practice. Please make yourself comfortable. I know um, most of the people in this room, and I know you're am among some of the foremost experts in career pathways. Like we hope for all young people in our educational system, we hope to create this collaborative learning environment. Sometimes it gets a little bit messy, but we roll up our sleeves to share examples of what is and isn't working and come together in the spirit of collaboration and driving to solution. At the Greater Twin Cities United Way, we hold this space with the goal of amplifying the excellence that already exists in the career pathway system. Like I said, the experts are in this room or in our network. So feel free to get comfortable and, and get to know your virtual neighbor um, and ask a lot of questions. We, we really here are committed to rapidly adapting and scaling change in this career pathway space. And we know that our experts are really collaborative and will tell you um, what you need to be able to be successful as you build an in-school or out-of-school pathway to build future education and future educators. Um, we are blessed with this rich network from employers to nonprofits, out of school time providers and educators at all levels coming together to support students to find their passion and leverage opportunities that they have right in front of them. We're gathered to learn about that, a school system that has ignited passions for both educators leading the work and students who will see themselves as educators in the future. I am delighted to share um, the work underway by both of these phenomenal pre um, presenters. Uh, we will start with an example from Burnsville High School um, and the work that Ka Dr. Kathy Funston is leading in partnership with Matt Deutsch. So please um, welcome them. Um, from that, we'll move into Dr. Bianco and the Pathways to Teaching program. We'll have a short closing with the survey. So we hope you stay around and tell us what other topics you'd like us to put together. After that, we will have um, what we lovingly call the meeting after the meeting. So that moment when um, in person, we would be able to get together, talk about how things are going, ask questions in the collaborative space. It's a little more difficult in Zoom, but we're holding time and um, some of our presenters will be able to stay after and connect with you if you need that. And um, Liz and I are here always um, as an opportunity to connect both personally and professionally with what's going on. So I hope you enjoy the next 90 minutes and um, we'll get underway, starting with uh, Dr. Kathy Bunston and team. We are so appreciative of being able to be in this space with all of you to share Burnsville's story around how do we recruit and retain teachers in our classrooms, especially teachers of color. And before we begin, I really do want to uh, thank Serene and Liz and the Greater Twin Cities United Way. Uh, they have walked alongside Burnsville in our equity journey. They have nudged us in our, you know, in their thought leadership and helping us see things differently and innovatively, and also providing opportunities like this to learn from each other and from national experts like Dr. Bianco. So thank you very much. Burnsville, just a little bit of background about Burnsville. In 2016, Burnsville converted from a traditional high school to a Walt Wall Career Pathways High School, and we have four broad career fields, 14 pathways, we have more than nine industry certifications and several of those are stackable. We offer 24 concurrent college course courses with multiple credits for our students. Uh, partnership is huge um, in our district and we have 200 plus partners. And uh, our program has also been uh, both regionally and nationally recognized. So we've been very fortunate with committed people and the support that we've uh, obtained from our community to launch our pathways. The current pathways, you can see here, uh, we have the different pathways for each, but today we really are talking about the education pathway. And the education pathway for us falls within the health sciences and human services career field area. And when we developed this program, you can see that we really did want to help students think about their journey into being an educator by stacking courses, and these are all elective classes, but stacking elective classes in a way that made sense and also helped them winnow down, is education the right pathway for me or is it not? Because knowing what you wanna do and what you don't wanna do are equally valuable. When we uh, started our pathway, we were fortunate. We started with a Grow Your Own grant from the Minnesota Department of Education and we launched the pathway in 2018-19. And at that time, Randy Weingarten came and visited us. And quite frankly, we all recognize 10 years ago, we had 5% teachers of color in Minnesota. 
Well, today we only have 5.2% teachers of color, whereas our students of color are up to 34% now in Minnesota. So there is a huge disconnect and all of our national organizations, our foundations, the Greater Twin Cities United Way, we're all thinking about how do we increase our students of color to be interested in being teachers of color in the classroom and be role models and mentors for the, teach for the students that we have in our schools, all of our students in the schools. Starting a pathway uh, really depends on a commitment from the leadership in your district, also from the schools in your district. But really more than anything, it's seeking the brilliance and passion in the educators that you're going to have lead this pathway. And we were incredibly fortunate. Uh, we found both brilliance and passion. And uh, Matt Deutsch, who's gonna be speaking to you uh, right now, he is someone that was teaching English in our, in our high school and we found out that he was also a licensed chef. So we tapped him to be our culinary instructor. And just to give you a little idea of how wonderful he is, in the second year of the culinary program, Matt was named the 2018 Pro Start Teacher of the Year. So he has brought that same leadership to the education pathway, and we are just incredibly fortunate to have him. So Matt, I'm going to uh, pass this to you. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you everybody for being here um, and allowing me to share something that I'm so passionate about. Um, teaching these students who want to be teachers is um, definitely one of the highlights of my day and brings me joy um, every day to see them growing and learning and wanting to share in this really cool um, career that we have and so many of us have had the opportunity to be part of. You can move to the next slide, Kathy. So we started our training. We went to Pathways to Teaching um, with Dr. Bianco and she's going to share more about that, but it was a week long intensive course. And I think the most powerful thing that was that we got to meet with teachers who were currently teaching the course so they could tell us really how it is. And it was, I think, so I've been a teacher for 18 years and it was the most important and transformative professional development that I've had. And um, being there together um, to talk, talking about the passion that we have for teaching and talking about all of our students and meeting the needs of all of our students was one of the most important things that I've done. Um, it was a powerful training because we got to create exemplars and create and design assignments that we were gonna use for the upcoming semester. I think one tool that I use today and you should all take a look at is the link that I provided here to um, a website that Dr. Bianco's team created um, with featuring scholars of color and bringing the scholars of color into all of the coursework that we do. And I found so many connections to this training because it really um, supported the work that our district had um, already started to become a culturally proficient school system. You can move to the next slide, thank you. And um, in our pathway at Burnsville High School, students can get some classes that um, have articulated credit like child psychology and development and the preschool lab or they can take um, and or they can take the classes that I teach um, in partnership with Normandale so they get um, concurrent enrollment credits um, they can graduate with seven credits it's mostly seniors some juniors and I think the power in these credits is not only the learning but also their transferability they're part of the Minsky transfer curriculum they go all over the state and to other states too. I've had students take them to private colleges and um, public colleges outside of our state. Um, for me though, I think the most important thing, other than the content of course, is um, that there's no barriers for enrollment. And um, I, don't think, I don't think I could teach this if there were barriers. And um, I don't, I, I'd make a big stink and I have, you know, when someone tried to put a barrier in, I took that barrier out and I will not allow it. And um, Normandale is super helpful too, because they just have this waiver and I will sign any waiver because the majority of these students want to be here and they're going to try hard and they're going to pass. The thing that Normandale worries about is that they're gonna have an F on a transcript and um, that's gonna impact their future. But since most of the kids wanna be there, if there's one or two kids that I have to work really hard to get to pass, I can do that. So no barriers for enrollment. Um, 
I think we have to have more courses um, nationwide that don't have barriers for enrollment. Next slide, Kathy. Thank you. Um, some of the student outcomes that I think are most important for our students is they have a 25 hour field experience. We've done that at middle school level, we, but we've typically now started to do it at elementary school level. Um, the students love this, the teachers love having them in and being that first mentor to them. They do an action research project. I'm gonna show you some of the topics in a minute and it's amazing. Um, they have a sharing component with the community and they do a poster session. And um, I think something that um, is pretty cool is that for this action research, they do surveys and um, they ask me to post the surveys to places. So I'm part of a huge facts teacher Facebook page. And so we have people all over the nation filling out our surveys. They'll survey their peers here. Some of our surveys will get six or 800 respondents and um, it's all student designed and um, it's, it's pretty powerful. Again, the credits easily transfer and there are no barriers. I have to tell you one quick story about a student. Um, uh, they were, they felt like they hadn't been ready to be a student in ninth and 10th and 11th grade, but then in senior year, they were ready to be a student. And the barriers to so many of our other courses kept that person from being the student that they wanted to be. Um, but in, in the class that I team taught, um, they really shone through and it was so cool to see. And it's really powerful to hear about how um, those barriers keep them out of the other courses. Um, let's see, training that they can use immediately. Um, I have one student right now who asked me the other day, if they were going to get a transcript at the end of the, the, the class. And I said, of course, you'll get a transcript. And she was so excited because she works at a kinder care place and would get an immediate raise just for having taken a college course about teaching. So I thought that was pretty powerful too. Next slide, Kathy. So these are some of the research topics that they, they have done. And um, I'm just going to let you look at them. So Kathy, you can click again, but stop at the green one and click again. Go ahead. Oh, this one was so cool. The student um, did a survey to see how many of our students took the ACT multiple times. We offer it once for free at Burnsville High School. And the student took the data on how many kids have taken the test, how many times, and then um, in questions about their socioeconomic background and um, questions about their identity and race and things like that, and did a comparison to see if um, if that impacted how many times they took the test. That was really powerful. Next slide. There we go, some other ones. And the kids all come up with these questions and we do the whole research process with it. All right, so those are the questions. We'll talk more about those if you have questions afterward. So this is a quote from one of my students, Olivia. Um, she graduated in 2018. She was in my English class in 2016 or 17. And um, that's how she feels about teaching. And here she is, she's student teaching right across the hall from me right now. And um, that's really cool to see too. I hope she sticks around and becomes a teacher at Burnsville High School. She's trying to um, finish up to be a special education teacher. And as we all know, people are hiring special ed teachers. I think we have openings right now for them. Next slide. This is another student, Daniela. She was talking about with her peer group about how they didn't have teachers of color. And she said it really made her passionate about, a be about becoming a teacher of color so that students like her will see um, teachers that are the same as her. That was really powerful. She's in school. Um, I have to check where she goes to school. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, you know, we've had our program now in operation for three years. So we have three years of data and all of our students tell us either they're going into education or they're not. So out of those three years, we've had 65 students say, yes, I am entering education and they uh, enroll in a teacher preparation program. So far, we've had 29 people or, t or students indicate that they want to go into elementary education. Almost the same want to go into the secondary area. 10 want to do something around music or the arts. And yes, we have three who want to go into special education. And as Matt indicated, this is a huge need 
um, for everyone, I think, um, around the country. So looking at some of the statistics on our students who did uh, graduate through the education pathway and enroll in a teacher approved program, 29% of our students um, are male, which is really fantastic. We are very interested in, in particular, black males entering elementary, and we're partnering with Black Men Teach Twin Cities to do just that. 71% of our students going into education are female. 25% of our students, sorry, are uh, students of color, and then 75% of our students are white. And one thing that we do, and I think a lot of uh, schools do this as well, we really celebrate our students. You know, we celebrate our student athletes and they have big signing days where they're gonna go to school and who they're gonna play for and all of this. We should celebrate our, our students who want to go into education with equal gusto. And so we do make a very big deal about it. We have a signing day and uh, students get a certificate and, uh, and it's just a very, very special event for our students in our school. And we are certainly um, happy to entertain any questions if we have time or after the presentations today, I think Matt and I might be hanging out just a little bit to answer any questions you may have. And Isabella, if you can uh, take back control and stop my slideshow, that would be great. Thanks, Kathy. I'm just gonna jump in to give an open invitation to any questions that might come up. Anyone wanna grab the mic? I can jump in. Matt, I just love to see how excited you get about Pathways. And so I am just, I'm curious if you can give us another example of a student story or success that you've seen um, in the three years of the program. Um, yes, I think I found some students that, you know, maybe they thought they were going to be a teacher, but after we got into all of the content, they decided that maybe um, educational policy um, or research was more of the path for them as an individual instead of teaching. I think that's fantastic. Kathy, you and I sat in a classroom once where we had individuals who clearly said that they came to that class to figure out what this teaching thing was all about because they hadn't received or enjoyed being a classroom student. How do you market or know, let students know that, yeah, that, that opinion's welcome here. It doesn't have to be for people who've seen and wanted to be a teacher their whole life. I think right now the best marketing is uh, word of mouth from the students. These students are passionate about what they're doing, what Matt is doing in the classroom, and just the openness of the dialogue and the ability to research topics that they are passionate about that have meaning for them. One of the things, recruitment, I will tell you, is huge. And especially if you're trying to recruit students of color, because in Burnsville, we have 67% of our students are students of color, but only 4% of our teaching staff are, are teachers of color. And just like the poll that we saw earlier, it's just representative of the experiences that almost all of us have had. So to encourage our students of color to go into an education pathway where they have not seen themselves throughout their educational journey is really tough. We have a colleague in our district um, who is um, a person of color. She's now an assist associate principal at the high school. She actually went in and sat in the lunchroom and had a table where she would entertain questions from the students. You know, she made it very approachable. The students felt comfortable uh, talking with her. And so we were able to recruit a large number of students of color just by having um, a person who can be a champion for those students and they can see themselves going into that pathway. But I will tell you recruitment is, is a challenge. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, so I'm gonna ask my question. I, that means I get to ask my question. Um, I'm wondering if, I, this is just so exciting and I think there's so much to celebrate here and in this pathway. 
And I, I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about how lessons that maybe, or a lesson that you've learned um, within the future teacher pathway that has helped you to inform the pathways overall or another pathway and kind of how you approach and think about um, the pathways work at Burnsville. Um, I, I think, oh, I'm gonna answer the question in the chat and then I'm gonna answer your question, Liz. The question in the chat was, how do they fit it in their schedule? We are lucky at Burnsville High School that the students get most of their required courses done in their um, first year, sophomore and junior years. So they have room in their schedule. And then to answer your second question, Liz, I think I, for the first time in my career, really understood the power of team teaching. The first three times I taught this course, it was team taught and it was so powerful to have two adult voices with different backgrounds and interests and um, experience levels in the same room together. Um, and I think, I think everybody should be team teaching more often. I think it's a really transformative part of being a teacher. Thanks, Matt. Oh, and Liz, I'm just going to add on to that real Please, quickly. Yeah. One of the lessons that we've learned, I think, is when the students are doing that action research and they are exploring that passion, they're able to really attack a topic that is meaningful to them. And I think what it has done, it has opened our eyes to realize that learning uh, is not seat time, learning is not by a bell schedule, learning is 24 seven and we need to provide options for students to learn inside and outside of the classroom 24 seven and with a multiple uh, variety of modalities. So we are actually in the process of kind of looking at blowing up that schedule, uh, allowing students to create their own pathways through the passions that they have. And that's a direct um, feedback loop for us from our students doing all that wonderful action research in the education pathway. That's fantastic, Kathy. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thanks. Thank you to both of you um, for being here today. And this short amount of time, I'm sure you piqued a lot of interest or additional questions in the chat. Um, but thank you both for being here today. I think this is a great intro and segue into um, our next guest speaker, uh, Dr. Margarita Bianco. So I think Kathy and Matt, if you have a minute, there's a couple questions in the chat, feel free to answer them in the chat. Or um, like Kathy said, there'll be a couple minutes after the meeting um, to touch base with them, but thank you again. So we will move to our next speaker. Um, I am thrilled to be able to introduce Dr. Margarita Bianco uh, and her team. Uh, Dr. B Margarita Bianco is an associate professor in the School of Education and Human Development at the University of Colorado Denver. Professor Bianco teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in special education, educational psychology, and urban community teacher education. Prior to joining the faculty at CU Denver, Dr. Bianco worked as a K-12 classroom teacher for more than 20 years in public and private schools in the U.S. and overseas. Dr. Bianco is also the founder and executive director of the Pathways to, Teach of Pathways to Teaching. Also, sorry, I have a couple dogs just wandering around right now. Um, She's the executive director of Pathways to Teaching, an innovative pre-collegiate program designed to encourage high school students of color to ent enter the teacher workforce as a way to disrupt educational inequities. And we are just so thrilled to have Dr. Bianco here with us today, um, who has also brought with her two participants of the program, who I'll allow her to introduce. Uh, but Dr. Bianco is really an expert in designing these educational opportunities with equity and student voice at the center. And we are so grateful to have you here, Dr. Bianco and your team. Um, so if you have questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat throughout the presentation. Um, that way we'll be able to line up the questions for, for the last about 15 minutes of the presentation today. Um, but without further ado, I will pass to you, Dr. Bianco. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, hi, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, I just want to uh, thank you all for this invitation today. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I have multiple partners in Minnesota, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, but a special shout out to Matt, who I've had the pleasure to observe that classroom when he was co-teaching with Haley, and they're doing a remarkable job. So thanks, Matt, for all the good work that you're doing and being able to showcase that today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of things during this presentation. Um, my work with Pathways to Teaching and the other work that I do around 
uh, teacher recruitment and retention uh, for teachers of color and indigenous teachers is really informed by uh, my personal experience and my professional experience. So you're gonna hear a little bit about my story and who I am, and I want you to look for the ways that it informs this work. Um, I will talk about the Pathways to Teaching program um, as a career pathway to become a teacher uh, for high school students of color and indigenous youth. Um, the guiding principles that inform this work and that should also look to inform other career pathways as well. Um, and then I really want you to take advantage of the student's perspective. So you're gonna hear from two students who've been through the program and who are now college students, um, Jocelyn and New, and I'm gonna introduce them in a little bit, but um, I just wanna make sure that you know that they're here and I hope you get to ask them questions and learn from them as well. So Jocelyn, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and is New here yet? Um, I don't think New is here okay. yet. Um, so uh, go ahead and, yeah, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about um, how the Pathways to Teaching informed your career path. For sure. Um, hi everyone, my name is Jocelyn Garcia Moreno. I am a current master program student at CU Denver. I was in the Pathways to Teaching program when I was in high school, um, Southwest Denver. I graduated in 2018 from high school with my paraprofessional certificate, thanks to Pathways to Teaching. I be, uh, became a paraprofessional, a math para at Lincoln um, two months after I graduated high school. Uh, so Pathways to Teaching really um, made that possible um, for me to become a para there. I graduated last May for, with my general mathematics um, bachelor in science and this year I started my master's in secondary mathematic, um, mathematics education. I am um, really passionate about education and a lot of that comes from taking pathways to teaching. I always knew that I wanted to be a math teacher because I liked math. Um, I always enjoyed education, um, but it wasn't until I took pathways to teaching that I realized that that was my my calling in a way, the things that I learned in the program and the classes that I took opened my eyes in ways that I don't think I would have been able to if it wasn't for the program. I was born here in Denver. When I was seven years old, I moved to Mexico, to Durango, Mexico. Um, and I came back when I was 14. I started school at an all white school. Uh, and I, I think I was at the 10th Mexican and I was learning English. My English was really bad. I barely knew how to communicate with others. Um, and so I went through a lot of microaggressions, a lot of um, discrimination and racism that I didn't really know what was going on. You know, I just felt like I wasn't understanding things until I took the first course of the Pathways to Teaching class, I entered to social justice. And I, I just learned that what I went through wasn't right. Um, first of all, because of what I was receiving from teachers, um, but just in general, that my experience uh, was valid. I felt heard in that class. And I know a lot of my other peers, when we were taking that class together and the discussions that we had, we, we just knew that we were heard um, as people of color, as a Latina first generation student. I, I felt like my voice was heard. I learned a lot. Um, and so, yeah, I pursue my dream and um, I'm closer than ever to becoming the teacher that I wish I always had. So Jocelyn is just amazing. So I'm glad she's here with us. Thanks, Jocelyn, for sharing that. Um, developing the Pathways to Teaching program has really been both personal and professional for me. Um, my work is influenced by who I am. So I identify as multiracial Puerto Rican Latina. I'm first in my family to graduate from high school and go on to college. I almost dropped out of high school several times um, and I needed to learn how to navigate harsh environments. So when I say harsh environments, college even can be a harsh environment for students of color, especially first gen students who don't know how to navigate those spaces. Um, and I became a teacher so that I could be the teacher that I never had. Uh, that's a really common story for teachers of color and indigenous teachers. Uh, many of us don't go into the field because we loved it and loved school. We go into it to change uh, the inequities that we experienced ourselves. 
Um, I was a classroom teacher for more than 20 years. And anytime I do a presentation, I take the moment to honor my ancestors for the sacrifices they made so I can be in the position that I am today. Um, as a first gen student, um, I didn't know what I didn't know. So you'll see how this really, uh, you know, understanding that navigating college space for a first gen student uh, really influences a lot of the curriculum design for Pathways to Teaching courses. So we do a lot around having students learn how to become self, good self advocates, um, how to navigate those spaces. Um, uh, I, you know, I needed to work when I graduated high school. So I worked as a paraprofessional while I was taking undergraduate courses. So that also influenced uh, the design of the program, knowing that by earning a paraprofessional certificate after taking three courses in high school, it will prepare students to work. And hopefully what we do is we try to work with the HR departments to make sure that they can hold space and do preferential hire for our Pathways to Teaching graduates so that they can be paras while they're taking their undergrad courses. This has been really a hallmark of our success so that students like Jocelyn, uh, you know, are able to work immediately after graduating high school in an environment that's going to continue to support them, right? Instead of working at a McDonald's or someplace that might not want to take into consideration, um, you know, their school schedule. So anyway, all of these things influence the design of the Pathways to Teaching program. Um, when I was in high school, my guidance counselor, that's his real name, Mr. Binet, and that's actually his real picture. He uh, said to me that I wasn't college material and I shouldn't even consider applying to college. Um, again, sadly, this is a real common experience for students of color, even really bright students who are not seen as having great potential. Um, so I had the choice, I almost believed him and truthfully, I did not go to college right away after high school because I was um, you know, in that imposter syndrome kind of mentality where I thought, well, you know, perhaps I'm not college material. Luckily, that paraprofessional environment, you know, surrounded me with, with people who were either in college or graduated college, who were educators, and so they could really help me navigate that college application process. So you can see again, how this influences that program design around really building student self-esteem up and making sure that they um, have access to people who understand the education system once they are out of high school. Um, you know, what great question to start our uh, presentation off when we talked about when did you feel seen and heard in school? And my response was never. And it's the truth. I mean, I there was no representation for me in terms of not ever having a Latina teacher in K through 12 or even through my doctorate program. So, you know, the only Latinas that I saw were serving food and cleaning toilets. And I, you know, don't get me wrong, there is nothing wrong with serving food and, and janitorial staff, but in terms of who do we see as having authority and power and knowledge, these are the women that um, I was exposed to that looked like me. So certainly not in teacher or administrator roles. Um, so that leads me to a, an important question that I think about all the time and that whenever I do training, I always start with. It's about what message is conveyed to students of color regarding the authority of knowledge and legitimacy of power when students experience school with a predominantly white teacher workforce? And what message is conveyed to white students about who has the power and the authority of, and legitimacy of power? So, you know, this is just an important question, I think, for us to think about, especially as you develop any kind of career pathway. We can change that and not just talk about teachers, but we could talk about lawyers and doctors and healthcare professionals. Um, you know, even in the criminal justice system, who are the judges? Who are the police officers? So I just, you know, think that and want to encourage those of you that are developing other career pathways. Um, to keep that in mind and help students see that as an important question to think about. So my work is about uh, and around teacher diversity, both in recruitment and retention, developing grow your own programs, not just as educators. So I've been working with people in other career pathways too, 
always to embed that college and career readiness in courses, curriculum and instruction, teacher training, and certainly around anti-racist teaching and culturally sustaining uh, curriculum and design. Shout out to Minnesota with all my partners here and Duluth and Burnsville and Eden Prairie, great support for our work in Minnesota, which started a number of years ago when this report was published. Um, and then shortly after that, and I don't remember what year that was, 2016 or 17 maybe. And then shortly after that, I was invited to come and do a number of conferences and, and co-present with superintendents around the state. So it's really been an amazing partnership. And there are some pictures. There you are, Matt, if you're still there. And Haley, I had the pleasure of visiting their class a few years ago, and it was really wonderful. Um, we've got Pathways to Teaching programs all across the country. Um, our newest partner is in New Orleans, where we're partnering with several HBCUs and high schools there. We have programs in Asheville, North Carolina, throughout Colorado, Tennessee, upstate New York, um, and obviously several in Minnesota. Um, so when we talk about teacher diversity, and this is something that I share with districts around the country, we have to be careful about how we think about increasing representation in, uh, in teachers. So what we talk about it often in uh, oftentimes in terms of numbers, but what we really need to start doing is talking about teacher diversity as a way to increase the quality and excellence of education for all students. So it isn't just about the numbers, it's about getting diverse perspectives and diverse life experiences because of race and gender um, to get those diverse experiences in front of the classroom. So it's not just about the numbers. And again, this is true for all career pathways. So in case you didn't know, there are 40% of school districts in the United States that don't have a single teacher of color. So that means that kinder from kindergarten or pre-K actually through PhD, it's impossible to never have a teacher or faculty of color throughout your entire educational trajectory. And as was mentioned before, we have this you know, really critical and urgent teacher shortage throughout the country. And I know in Minnesota, you have the shortage around special ed and bilingual teachers and STEM, same thing throughout the country. Um, and then of course, a, you know, tremendous teacher student diversity gap that exists in Minnesota and around the country. And so grow your own programs are frequently cited as a way a potential solution to address both the teacher shortage and the teacher diversity gap. And so that's what really motivated me to develop the Pathways to Teaching program. Uh, one of the things that I think really um, makes our program a little different from some of the others is that I spent about two or three years before I even started the Pathways to Teaching program and did extensive research around what would make um, a, a Grow Your Own program successful. And so reading all the literature, the research around what exists, what's successful, what isn't, I started to theme those, um, the elements of successful programs and came up with these guiding principles, which I'm gonna highlight um, in a moment. But you know, here you can see them on your screen. Uh, the role models and mentors is hugely important. And I'm gonna have Jocelyn talk about that in a minute. Um, that college and career readiness is certainly, you know, really important as well. Um, the research talks about, you know, making sure that as you develop the Grow Your Own programs that you're focusing on academic skills and the skills that we focus on are, are academic writing because we're finding that many teachers especially are coming into undergrad and grad programs and simply don't know how to write. And so the academic writing is big for us. And as Matt talked about, that critical lens or that critical pedagogy is huge. And we really emphasize that as students do their research projects. So as we talked about earlier, students get to pick a topic of interest to them and do a real deep dive. And then, um, so for example, we've had students research the, um, uh, English only policies. And so we have a lot of Latino students in Denver who speak Spanish as their primary language. And so these English only policies that are enacted in schools 
are really prejudicial and hold students back. And so we have lots of students examining that. Um, so let me just highlight a few more and then I'm gonna have Jocelyn jump in here. Um, we have the concurrent enrollment, all of, our, all of our courses, we partner with a local teacher prep program. So it's nine credits for three courses. All of our courses have a social justice and equity lens. That's right directly from the research in terms of how can we attract young uh, students of color to think about teaching. And one of the things that we know is that teachers of color go into the field because of social justice and racial uplift. So we embed that throughout everything we do. They all have a field experience, which as Matt talked about is really important, uh, that college readiness and acad uh, academic writing is also very important. Um, so when I was developing the curriculum, the question that I had and wanted to answer was, what if you helped students understand the systems of oppression that contribute to their marginalization and develop their critical consciousness and see teaching as an act of social justice? And that's what we do. And I think Matt talked about that a little bit. So Jocelyn, I'm going to have you jump in and just quickly talk about um, how that helped you in terms of deciding to pursue education and the inequities that you um, studied when you were in the courses? Yeah, so when I, like I said, the first course that I took that with Pathways to Teaching that really um, made me understand that teaching was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be part of the change that we need to see because of my experiences. I know that I wasn't the only student going through a lot of, um, like I said, microaggressions that we went through. And actually that course is where I learned what microaggressions were. Before that, I didn't even heard the word before um, in any other context. And so we were talking about things that were really um, deep in a way that things that we wouldn't have the chance to speak about in other classes. We, I always like to think that we, really have the opportunity to speak our truth because all of the times, um, a lot of the times we're living the truth of another community, of another um, culture that it's not ours. And so we got to really experience what it was to um, understand who we are as people of color, the marginalization that we've had throughout history in this country, um, and how we can create a voice from to our, for our, ourselves, sorry, um, so that we can go out there and help others that maybe had a similar experiences to us. And um, all of these classes really prepared us to have those difficult conversations with other professionals or anyone else that maybe um, don't understand what social justice means for us as people of color. Thank you, Jocelyn. In fact, this photograph here, um, Jocelyn, you may remember, this was at the Teachers of Color and Allies Conference. And one of the things that we try to do often, and I encourage you, regardless of what um, career pathways you're working with, is to provide opportunities for students to be the experts, because they are. And so this photograph I love is uh, at a conference where our Pathways to Teaching students did a professional development full workshop day with teachers and school administrators uh, throughout the district. And so um, we trained students how to run these PDs for uh, organizations. And anyway, it was a fabulous day and they did a great job and Jocelyn was there that day as well. So here are the three courses in the sequence. One is the introduction to socially just education. Then we have kind of like an introduction to special education and an introduction to multilingual learners. Um, the goal is, as I said before, for students to be hired right when they graduate as a paraprofessional so that they can be employed immediately in a supportive environment for them. Uh, what's coming soon, and this is, you know, I've been asked by a number of districts, we're going to start with, we're going to have an early childhood course. So it'll be around so social justice in the early childhood years, and then also a STEM course. Those will be ready in the fall, next fall 22. So that school districts will have kind of a menu of courses to choose from to develop a, a paraprofessional certificate. 
Um, again, you know, I want to emphasize the fact that we're not simply trying to create a new cadre of teachers. I want to develop disruptors of educational inequities. And again, I think that that's a difference um, than other uh, grow your own programs for teachers or clubs for teachers. So we're not, you know, we don't focus on, for example, the milestones that toddlers go through and um, we don't talk about Piaget. We're really focused on social justice and equity. Students will learn about, you know, the educational theory when they get into college, but for right now, the focus is on why it's important for them to be there as disruptors of the inequities that they've experienced. And Jocelyn, I think you kind of already mentioned that, but do you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, um, I just keep saying that it the, the, these courses really allowed us to um, understand how we can and I'm going to rephrase the, the, the sentence that I said it before to how to have the power in our voices to have those difficult uh, conversations in uh, educational inequities. Um, and so now that some of us are preparing to be teachers, educators in the near future so that we can have, we can be those disruptors in our schools that we go into to make the changes that our students uh, need in, the, in, the, in this educational system. Exactly. And I don't know, has New joined us yet? Jocelyn, would you text her and just see if she's on with us yet? Will do. Okay. Um, so the guiding principles, and Matt did a great job talking about the importance of no GPA. Um, this is something that I'm unapologetic about with any of my partners. Um, if, if a school district wants to impose a GPA requirement, then, you know, I politely ask them to find another partner, but we need to seek, we seek to eliminate all the barriers. And again, I think Matt did a good job explaining why that's important. But I do want to point out that um, on the Pathways to Teaching website, there are multiple videos of students. Jocelyn is there, but I have a student from Burnsville who did an excellent job talking about, and Matt, maybe you can jump in later and let me know. I can't remember the student's name. But she did such a phenomenal job explaining how the no GPA requirement was what enticed her to take the course and actually enticed her to think about becoming a teacher and going to college, something that she hadn't considered before. So please visit the website and check out those videos. Um, you know, one of our um, guiding principles is around that mentorship. And this is a great picture. And I'm going to have Jocelyn talk about the importance of mentorship here too. But so this is a great example. So I was preparing a presentation for um, the Indigenous Education Research Conference in New Mexico. And I had uh, Pearl, who was a, a, a Native American high school student in the Pathways program. Um, Sina, who was my PhD student, Native American, and Anastasia, who was an undergrad student, also Native American. So I got these young women together. So we had a high school student, an undergrad student, a PhD student, and a tenured faculty, all with Native uh, background and mentoring each other. So we all presented together. It was a phenomenal trip that we did to New Mexico. But um, so I refer to it as intergenerational mentoring and it's powerful and it's super important for student success. So we were all first generation students. This was, uh, anyway, it was just a really powerful experience. So Jocelyn, I know that you've benefited from the mentorship that we provide in Pathways. So you wanna talk a little bit about that? Totally, yeah. I cannot be more thankful for the opportunity to have these amazing mentors through the program. Once I started uh, college at CU Denver, you know, I'm first generation college student with college student with parents who don't speak English. Uh, my mom went up to ninth grade, my dad went up to sixth grade. So even if they wished that they could help me, um, they didn't know how to do that. And so having Dr. Bianco and the other um, graduate assistants at CU Denver helped me navigate through all through the system of being a college student uh, was something that made an entire difference of my perspective of college, of um, what I can do, how I can 
explore more of my identity as a professional and a college student. It's um, it's amazing what having a mentor in these type of uh, scenarios can, the, the change that it can make in your life. You know, one of our mottos is you can't be who you, you can't be who you don't see. And so we really think about how can we expose young people to scholars of color, indigenous scholars that they can see themselves reflected um, in other scholars around the country. New, are you here? Yes, I am. Oh, good. So why don't you talk a little bit um, and I wanna reintroduce New Vo, who is our new um, student here at CU Denver, who's a Pathways to Teaching graduate also. So New, can you talk for just a minute about the importance of mentorship in the Pathways to Teaching program and how you benefited from that? Yeah, for sure. So I would like to talk on how having a mentor and being able to have a role model really influences how you like how you choose your career path, especially for me, like I haven't had an Asian um, teacher of color or like really faculty, but I've had other Asian and Latino and black teachers who have been important influences in my life and also encourage me to pursue like education, which I don't see a lot of um, Asian teachers, or Asian faculty in. Great, excellent. Thank you. And even just today is a good example. So here we have Jocelyn, who's now a master's student in our program. And she's actually working with New, who is you know, a, a recent graduate and kind of mentoring her into doing presentations too. So Jocelyn is a pro, she's presented with me all over the country, but New is, uh, this is a, a new experience for her. So um, 13 years, no grant. So one of the things that's super important, and I know that this might be of interest to some of you that are preparing uh, for your grant that's due tomorrow, um, one of the things that I work with districts around is you might need a grant as seed money to start these Grow Your Own programs, but it's super important to build for sustainability. And I say that because in my research around grow, developing Grow Your Own programs, one of the things I learned immediately was there are these fabulous programs that start and end after a three-year funding cycle. So if you can think through, and, and I'm happy to you know, partner with you in this, but to think through how do you get all of your stakeholders to be invested in the program's success and longevity? And there are ways to do it. It's really not that difficult, but like I said, 13, this is our 13th year and we've not had a grant. So build for sustainability. A curriculum snapshot. So I know Matt mentioned the importance of introducing students to scholars of color. I wanna point out, so one of the things that we do do is I developed this website, as I mentioned earlier, with contemporary scholars of color. We encourage students to do digital stories, uh, you know, learning about each of these scholars or a few of the scholars. A fun activity that I encourage teachers to do is to create a My Future Self resume or CV so that students can pick, for example, Angela Valenzuela, who many of you uh, may be familiar with her work. Um, so if students are studying uh, Dr. Valenzuela's work and see where she graduated, see the books that she's written, see what her dissertation topic is, and then for have students develop their own CV um, you know, mirroring that, what's their dissertation topic? Where did they get their PhD? What's the title of the book that they've written? And so we're starting to create a scholar identity in these young students of color. So something to think about. And again, I strongly recommend that regardless of what your career path is, whether you're developing for education or for healthcare professionals, to include something similar uh, so that young people can see that there are uh, people who look like them who are the experts in the field, regardless of what the field is. Unfortunately, the narrative that we see in here is usually the white men who are successful in that field. So let's flip that narrative. It's all of our jobs to do that. Um, here are just some sample publications. I need to update this. We've got a great book that's coming out in the spring, um, uh, edited by Dr. Uh, Gist and Travis Bristol. Um, and I am a section editor around recruitment that's going to be published by the uh, AERA. So I can, once we have some flyers, I'll be happy to send that out. 
But uh, again, I wanted to uh, make this presentation fairly short so we had lots of time for questions. Um, and I hope that you ask lots of questions for Jocelyn and New. Um, please, please visit the Pathways to Teaching website so that you can see lots of videos of students. If you want to learn more about me and my work, you can find it there or margaritabianco.com. There's my email address. And for those of you that might have some spare change, we have a Pathways to Teaching scholarship fund that um, I'm going to have our hosts share the link uh, for. Uh, both New and Jocelyn have benefited from the scholarship fund. Um, and this is one way that I support students with their tuition. So again, thank you so much for this invitation. I look forward to talking to each of you more. And let me stop sharing. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Bianco and Jocelyn and New for being here today. Um, I will, I'll just prompt everyone to please put your questions into the chat. Um, and I can, I can kick us off, but I know that there are questions from the audience. So go ahead and put them in the chat or you can interrupt me at any time uh, if it's easier to come off mute and ask your question. Um, but I will, one of the things that um, I'll, I'll kick us off with questions is that I have been thinking about is, um, you know, at the beginning of our session, Serene shared just the disparity between Minnesota having 35% students of color and only 5% teachers of color. Um, and one of the things that we see is that in the outside of school time space in Minnesota, um, that there's much more um, staff members who reflect the diversity of the young people that they work with. And so I'm wondering, Dr. Bianco, if you have seen um, maybe outside of school time partnerships with in school time um, pathways efforts that have worked just because we know that there's a whole you know field of folks who might who might either enter the field but then also can act, can act as um, role models to young folks who don't get that as much in in this traditional school day yeah so i think you know one of the partnerships that i've seen uh, be successful is with uh, daycare centers for example so oftentimes the daycare centers are running you know later into the evening to accommodate uh, parents and families that work. And so sometimes uh, young people can get jobs at these daycare centers. Um, and that's one way that they start thinking about becoming teachers, you know, especially in the early childhood area. That's the one big one. The other one is boys and girls clubs. So oftentimes young people will volunteer or spend time themselves in the boys and girls club because that's where they hang out until parents can get them. But um, in that space, they often become role models and mentors as they get older for the younger kids. And so, you know, really developing partnerships with these um, agencies uh, and community organizations uh, that serve young people is a good way to start reaching out and have some outreach there as well. I hope that answered your question, Liz. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are those are great ideas. And I think we've seen an increase in um, partnerships in Minnesota just uh, during, especially during COVID as a result of COVID. Um, one of, there was a question in the chat, so let me find it here. Um, the question is, do students participate in field experiences or acquire experience in the various levels of teaching? So yes, yeah, so that's really becomes a school, uh, a school choice. So some of our high schools are like right around the corner from an elementary school. And so they do their field experience at the elementary level. Some schools are right around the corner from a middle school or maybe share the building with the middle school. So it really turns out to what's convenient for that high school teacher since the field experience is an embedded part of the course and part of the school day, right? So it needs to be uh, something that's in close proximity for the students to do during their school day. Um, also, it depends on the teacher's level of expertise. So, you know, Matt is, is great. So he could do middle school or elementary school and work with his high school students, you know, at either of those levels. But some high school teachers prefer to work with the kindergarten, first or second grade. So it really becomes an individual choice, but we try to have the high school students uh, work with as many different student populations as possible in their two years with us. Great, thank you. Um... My next question is for Jocelyn and New, and I'm wondering if you both could share 
Um, you know, you're on these really clear paths right now in your career. And I'm curious what your um, friends, like your friend group, what, like what they think about that sort of clear trajectory and your choice um, and maybe what your family's thinking about that too and how they've kind of received your, your decision to move forward uh, with teaching. Um, Nia, would you, would you like to go first? Oh, thank you. you. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I've had the same group of friends since I was, since I started at Lincoln, Lincoln High School in sophomore year. Um, I was one of the oldest ones in the group. And I remember one of my friends telling me, what do you want to teach? What, what do you want to do when you go to college? I said, I teaching that's that I've always knew I wanted to teach. And at that time I was taking publicity teaching. And so I told them teaching, like, there's no doubt. Um, and some of them thought, well, are you crazy? Like, are you, are you going to deal with all of these students and all of this, the things that go into teaching? And I said, I'm not crazy. I just, um, I wish someone did that for me. I wish someone was as passionate for teaching as I see some of my teachers being and Dr. Bianco, you know, and I felt really motivated and inspired. And so um, that okay, like everyone knew that I wanted to become a teacher. Now, uh, uh, when I started college, um, one of my my friends, that same friend that I said, are you crazy? What, what, why teaching? Um, she actually it went for nursing. Um, but she right now is in the process of deciding whether she wants to continue with her biology degree um, or switching into teaching. And so I asked her why she said, well, I now that I'm in college and, you know, she's also Latina. Now that I'm in college, I've experienced so many things going on, like even the injustices that we see continue on into uh, higher education. And now I get what you were saying when you were when we were in high school that it is, it, there's a lot of injustices that we don't really notice. And I, I'm thinking about being part of that change. So it's, we, we just had this conversation last week and it was just so amazing to hear that, um, that a lot of other Latinas and uh, people of color are inspired to actually be um, disruptors, like Dr. Bianco said. And for my family, you know, um, I'm one of the first college students that graduate from college um, in my family and you know they've been so excited for me to be a teacher that's um, that's kind of our entire dream as a family uh, and I'm an only child as well so it's everything really revolved around what I wanted to do and when I told my parents I want to teach I want to you know be part of the change they um, they just supported me and I've really appreciate that I've had that support. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing that, Jocelyn. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, New. Oh. <laughs> and yeah, like very similar to, to Jocelyn, like uh, my peers and classmates always, um, it was kind of lonely, I guess, being in a pathway to teaching pathway because um, yeah, I had similar like conversations with my friends. They're like, oh, why are you going into teaching? Like, it's a very difficult job. They highlight the difficulties. But like something I learned and something that motivates me to stay within education is that in fact that you can make social change and you can impact like a child's life. And like even impacting one can impact the community, can impact like socially and politically, um, like change in the education. So like, and concerning like my family, um, I have similar, also similar um, experience like with Jocelyn is that like for my family they value education and they value that I'm choosing to try to make a change and be a role model for Asian Americans um, as I'm going into education field. Thank you both so so much for that I think I hope that you know that you're you know both your ambassadors here in this presentation today and then I, what I can hear your ambassadors for teaching and for disrupting the teaching field in, in your own communities. And I'm just so grateful to, to both of you for sharing your story with this group of educators here today too. So this is the right crowd to hear the message. Um, Serena, I saw you come on camera. So I just wanna hand over if you, if you had a question that was top of mind for you. Yeah, um, I'm just curious to kind of follow up on that as you're acting as disruptors, as you're coming into a space that wasn't and hasn't historically been 
built or accommodating teachers of color well, how would you like folks to see and support teachers of colors that come into the field? As you're acting as a disruptor, how can other educators support you and or other teachers of color in the workforce? Thank you for your question. Um, something that like I found really accommodating to like um, my needs as like a possibly becoming a teacher of color is like um, schools providing a community where teachers and faculty of color can come and be support to one another. And like, cause we understand from a different background where we're coming through, where we see barriers students are facing that we also face. So um, being able to have a community and space where we can talk through um, barriers, talk through um, struggles that we're also facing as we're teaching our, our students um, really provides the support for us to be able to continue on our path. And adding to that, I really want to bring back to what Dr. Bianco said in her presentation that Pathways to Teaching is not only about recruiting teachers of color, but also retaining them. And it's really important to understand that often the experiences that, uh, that students of color or uh, white poor students, that the experiences that they're going as they go through their K to 12 and even higher education, some of these travel with them into being teachers. And so, having a, like New said, a community and a support system in schools that values teachers of color and values their experiences, um, values their culture, their uh, traditions and everything around what makes them a good teacher and a good educator um, and also a good person that they feel supported. And, uh, you know, I think this becomes by understanding that yes, there's injustices, yes, there's differences um, between many areas around the spectrum of social justice and to come together as a whole as um, teachers of color, students of color, um, white allies and anything in between to, to help make things better. You know, I just wanna just jump in very quickly and share that um, one of the things that we can look at, if you look at the data on what are all the reasons and the inequities and the experiences that students of color have that push them out of school, you can look at those same issues and they're the very same reasons that push teachers of color out of the education profession. So we're looking at systems of oppression on various levels from you know, the experiences of students to the experiences of teachers. And one last point with this is we often talk about diversifying the K through 12 teacher workforce. And I don't know, I think we have some university partners in the audience, but it's also equally important for us to think about how do we diversify our college faculty? Um, one of the things that we know from the research is that young students of color, whether they're going into teaching or any profession, they're gonna wanna seek out faculty of color so that they have somebody as a role model and a mentor that they can um, reach out to. And there are very, very few of us, less than I think it is, uh, less than 2% of faculty around the country are Latino women. So yeah, I think it's less than 2%. So in any case, it's important for us to also focus on diversifying higher ed and not just the K-12 uh, school system. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone has their, their area where they're working on the issue, right? But it's the whole community coming together. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit with my next question, but, you know, being a skilled educator really crosses, I think, multiple pathways, right? Education is not necessarily just about a classroom teacher. Um, when we think about teaching and learning, you know, there's, there's opportunities in corporate settings, facilitation, um, adult learning. So I'm wondering if you, Dr. Bianco, could speak a little bit about how you're thinking about, or as you design, how you think about opportunities for students to, who maybe are, want to engage in a future educator pathway, um, but also envision a career that's maybe not necessarily inside the classroom, um, while balancing, I think, a, dif a difficult tension there, which is we do want teachers, we want teachers of color, um, but also want to be able to open up multiple opportunities. So one of the things, and I'm, I, 
I'm the perfect person to address this because I left the teacher workforce for a number of years and was a sales and uh, customer service training specialist and traveled the country and made about five or six times what my teaching salary was. Got to travel on corporate airplanes and all that kind of stuff. But um, so, you know, one of the things that I share with students is that to become a teacher, the training that you go through in terms of learning how to design curriculum, learning how to public speak, learning how to sell your ideas, those skills that you gain in your teacher prep program and the skills that you gain as a teacher translate into many, many other professions that, um, so those skills are valuable in a number of other settings. So my, my training as a teacher provided experience for me to be a very successful sales trainer. Um, and so when I talk to kids about that, but, and I'm saying, but you have to do the teaching first because you have to gain those skills. Like Jocelyn, she's an amazing public speaker from her experience in doing presentations. You know, I don't want Jocelyn to do anything else but become a math teacher right now, but her skills can translate into lots of other settings. So, you know, I think that young people have to recognize that um, you really have to become a master at some skills and then figure out how they translate across the board into other careers and professions. Thank you for that. Um, I am. I think we're getting a, we're getting close to our end of the time for questions, um, and I'm wondering. Uh, I will pop in with the questions. Serene, feel free to jump into if you if you saw one or had one. But um, I'm wondering if you all would maybe give us like a fine a final thought or closing thought that you have. Um, sometimes what we ask, and as I think about the people in the room today, would just be like, what would be either a piece of advice for an educator. I know we have parents in, in the audience as well, but I um, would love for each of you to share a, a final thought for today. I'll jump in and then I'll let the students have the final word. But, um, you know, I think one of the things that I said in my presentation that I really uh, want to hone in on is to view diversity, not just in terms of the numbers or a checkbox, right? To view, um, increasing the Latina representation or the African-American representation and so on needs to be viewed as contributing to the excellence and quality education for all students. Um, so anyway, I wanna leave it at that, but to make sure that we start shifting the mindset from numbers to value. And then to add on to that, like, um, something I would like to say to educators is that um, being a teacher of color, you're paving the pathway, you're being a role model just by simply pursuing the career, pursuing education. Um, you're paving the pathway and you're being a role model for students who otherwise would not ever consider going into education. So you're being a role model just through your ethnicity, just through your racial identity. Um, and just this nation and the world in general. Um, we're here for a reason and it's for them. And so let's consider who our students are um, because not all of our students are coming from the same background. Not all of them have had the same experiences. And so how can we create those better experiences for them um, so that they know and believe in themselves? Like I know that Dr. Bianco made me believe in myself. Um, how can we create that for not only a few students, not only students of color, but for all students. Um, I just think that we really need to understand the importance that teachers have in every single student, not just some. Thank you all so much um, and for that final word. And I just wanna let that, that be the final word. So thank you, Dr. Bianco and Jocelyn and you for being here with us today and, and spending your time with us and sharing your expertise. Um, if anyone had questions, I'll just do a last plug. Um, you can engage in the chat or um, stick after the session, but I will pass to Serene to, to close this out for today. Thank you all so much. Wow, thank you, Cassie, Matt, 
Dr. Bianco, New, and Jocelyn, I am so excited. I'm sorry for spamming the chat. Um, I really like to, I, Zoom is so flat for me these days that I don't know how to be an active listener without all of the emojis and um, chat. But I'm excited about the presentation and how the guiding principles you outlined, Dr. Bianco, were so clear. They created intentional pathways to support future teachers of color in pursuit of a career that, of educational justice in both their lives and their communities. I'm still thinking about the, you can't be what you can't see. I have four young people who refuse to believe that their father was a librarian because all librarians are girls. So just that 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 belief right in your own home um, that if you don't see it in front of you and you don't experience it, it can't possibly be true. So I'm so excited about the world, the world that you're creating and the pathways to future teachers of color. Um, I can see a clear role for all of us in this space, in the mentor, the parent, the educator, and the community work that you've outlined all through the lens of justice. We have the opportunity to support um, that scholar identity and to support scholars of color and teachers of color in this space. Um, I'm excited about the critical pedagogy of inclusion, acts of social justice to include BIPOC students in all of our pathways. So we work with career pathways of all kinds. So we start from that position of student first and career second. How can we um, support a vision where all young people have clear pathways to build wealth and power so that they can take their leadership positions in our community, whether that's teaching or otherwise. So thank you so much today. And I'm gonna pass it back to Liz. Thanks, Serene. The dogs don't cooperate, you know, they just do not. <laughs> um, well, as we close out today, um, Isabella will pull up a poll for everyone. Um, we hope that in, in the final minutes of the meeting today that you would kind of bear with us and take a quick survey. It's just a couple questions. Um, we do really use this information to inform our future sessions. So your feedback here helps us and um, helps us design our next session. Um, if you have any thoughts on today or um, any kind of topics that you would love to see us cover or speakers you would love to see us invite into our community of practice, please feel free to pop those into the chat. Again, we do, you know, these sessions are really driven by the feedback that we get from you all as our community of practice. Um, we want them to be as, as relevant and relatable as possible. So you should see a poll pop up in just a minute. Um, as that's showing up here, I will also pitch that today we're hosting a, what we call a meeting after the meeting. So if you're able to stick around um, from 3.30 to about four, uh, our speakers from today will be around for, for a few minutes to engage with them, um, maybe a little more personally, or if you had questions you weren't able to get answered. Um, typically we would be able to do this over a beverage, but we will settle for Zoom in the environment that we're in today. Um, but we hope that you can stick with us. We also understand that it is a lot to be staring at a computer for most of the day and you're all busy people. So no pressure to stay, but um, we hope that you'll engage in the poll and thank you everyone for being here today. We'll take just a couple minutes to transition um, into the meeting after the meeting, but thank you everyone for being here today and to all of our presenters. <laughs>